Hello everyone, thanks for joining Meditation with Mukul. Today's topic is atrial fibrillation. So let's get into it. What is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is the continuous and rapid activation of the atria. And this can happen from 300 to 600 beats a minute. So why does it happen? Um, there's automatic foci um, that's in the atria, usually in the um, left atrium, and that rapidly depolarize. These are most commonly um, located between the pulmonary veins. Let me just zoom into this diagram here and show you where the, pul where, um, the pulmonary veins are as a reminder. Um, and these automatic foci are usually um, uh, located here. And when there's um, catheter ablation um, requested for, for patients with atrial fibrillation, these are the sites the, the EP um, cardiologists would be, would be looking at um, ablating. Um, so in terms of um, what the ECG shows, um, the ECG shows loss of P waves, and these can sometimes be um, seen as, 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 as F waves. So there's no P waves because the atria isn't um, being depolarized in a synchronized manner. Rather, it, it, it's fibrillating. So you can sometimes see these tiny little F waves, which are these oscillations of the baseline. Um, the second, the second uh, pertinent finding is the irregular rhythm, as we all know. In terms of the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation, it's most common um, sustained arrhythmia, um, and, the, and, and lifetime risk is around about 25% in patients that are older than 40 years. In terms of risk factors for atrial fibrillation, age is probably one of the biggest risk factors. Um, structurally abnormal heart, so patients with um, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, heart failure, and, and valvular disease are all at risk. Um, and, and patients with um, aberrant conduction pathways, such as Wolf, Parkinson, White. Um, in terms of causes of atrial fibrillation, so the, this is not, you know, um, this is just something that I've come up with, um, and, and, and hopefully it, it helps you. Whenever... Um, uh, tasks to to think of causes of any any disease um, try and group it um, in a way that you can remember it. so I, I tend to split it into cardiac and metabolic cardiac being um, you know hypertension heart failure mitral stenosis um, so, so, such as rheumatic heart disease and or, or non-rheumatic mitral stenosis as well um, after heart surgery pericardial disease and PE I put PE in there because um, PE causes heart strain and that in turn um, can, can trigger atrial fibrillation. There's a metabolic acute infections. Pneumonia is a big one, um, can set off um, atrial fibrillation, especially paroxysmal or new onset atrial fibrillation. Thyrotoxicosis, pheochromocytoma, and electrolyte abnormalities as well. Um, in terms of clinical presentation of atrial fibrillation, Clinical presentation, you know, it, it could be asymptomatic. In about 30% 30, 30 of patients when atrial fibrillation is picked up, it's usually asymptomatic. Um, it can be found on a workup of stroke. Um, remember that one-fifth of all strokes are usually caused by atrial fibrillation. Um, or it can be symptomatic. So patients can experience palpitation, shortness of breath, chest pain. They can have reduced exercise tolerance or they can have worsening of their pre-existing disease. So they can have pre-worsening of their valvular disease, worsening of their um, heart failure and stuff like that. Um, in terms of classification of atrial fibrillation, um, we don't generally, we, we only really hear paroxysmal AF. Um, we, don't, we don't tend to hear other um, classifications, but I think it's, 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 it's a good idea to know what the other classifications are as well. So I tend to think of it as, as some key dates in the timeline. So the first one is seven days and the, the next one is one year. So, so the first um, uh, classification is first detected atrial fibrillation. And that can happen any, you know, whenever atrial fibrillation is, is, is detected for the very first time in a patient, that's first detected AF. Um, and, and patients could have possibly be symptomatic for like a year, it doesn't matter, but they, they, they generally, so that's called first detected AF. If, if atrial fibrillation resolves spontaneously within seven days, that's called paroxysmal AF. Um, it's called persistent when it persists longer than seven days, but less than a year. Um, and if it persists longer than one year, that's called long-standing persistent AF. And there's another entity called permanent AF, 
and that's a good one to know as well because permanent AF is essentially when AF is either long standing um, and it's you know it's it's failed multiple trials of of, of rhythm control therapy or um, is, is is a patient with um, uh, structurally really abnormal heart and there's been a the, the, essentially what it is is there's been a discussion with the patient and the clinician and they've come to a joint decision that there should be no longer any attempts to revert the patient's um, the rhythm back into sinus uh, and that's called permanent AF. Um, in terms of the next part of this topic is complications of atrial fibrillation. So these complications include thromboembolism, and you can um, you know these 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 because the atria are fibrillating, uh, clots um, form in the in the atria, and they can shoot off either in the brain. That's called um, CVA, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, stroke or TIA can present that way, and also ischemic bowel as well. Um, and, the, and the second complication is hemodynamic instability. So AF can cause um, uh, cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular compromise. Um, and it, it's usually when patients have a really, really weak heart or something else is going on and atrial fibrillation just, just, you know, just tips them over um, in, into cardiovascular compromise. Um, cardiomyopathy as well. Um, and cardiac failure. Um, other complicate uh, um, in terms of treatment of AF. So acute treatment of AF. Um, but there's, there's a couple of things to think about. So firstly, how will we control the rate? So ventricular rate control is quite important because a lot of these patients will run really fast, anywhere from um, 110 all the way up to um, sometimes even 200. So you want to you want to control their rate um, because their their cardio um, their cardiac muscle demand um, increases substantially if they stay at this rate for for periods of time. Um, and how do we do that with AV nodal blocking agents? And we can discuss that later. Um, cardioversion. So are we going to revert their? Um, are we going to try and revert their rhythm uh, into sinus? Uh, and that can be done electronically or chemically. And we'll discuss that a bit um, later on. Um, and whether or not there's an underlying cause that's triggering AF, and ha and and how we're going to treat that. Um, and also the very important bit is because one fifth of all strokes are caused by atrial fibrillation. It's very important to think. Um, about whether or not this patient needs to be on um, uh, anticoagulation or not. Um, so let's let let's delve into these topics a bit more. So rate control. How do we do that? There's a couple of agents that slow the conduction through the AV node. These include beta blockers, um, calcium channel blockers, um, and digoxin as well. So let's talk about beta blockers. They've got two options: um, atenolol and metoprolol. Um, atenolol, there's, you know, we can, we can start at 25 milligrams once daily and increase to 100 milligrams once daily. Metoprolol tartate, um, we we'll start at 25 milligrams once daily and increase to 100 milligrams BD. Um, just remember with beta blockers, for patients who have um, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, try and use beta blockers that are specific for heart failure. So these are nabivolol, carvedilol or um, metoprolol succinate. Um, and then the, the, the second option we spoke about is calcium channel blockers. And these are specifically non-dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blockers. So these are specifically the, the, the heart calcium channel blockers. And these include verapamil, the dose of which is 180 milligram once daily, and can increase all the way up to 480 milligrams once daily. And the next one is diltiazem, the dose of which is 180 milligrams and increases um, to, to 480 milligrams once daily as well. Um, just remember with, with the calcium channel blockers, there are some side effects. So these include excessive bradycardia um, and, and depressed contractility. Um, and you want to avoid, you want to avoid calcium channel blockers um, in, pa in patients with, um, with, with heart failure for this very reason. Um, Digoxin. Now, digoxin can be used either in conjunction with beta blockers or it can be used by itself. When it's used by itself, it's called digoxin monotherapy, um, obviously. So, so digoxin, um, just the thing to remember about digoxin is that it's a good drug, but it doesn't um, work that well 
um, for exercise-induced um, um, high ventricular rate in, in AF um, because on exertion, the, 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 um, the sympathetic tone just, just is, is way too much for the toxin to handle and it usually is not that um, sufficient for, for rate control in that case. Um, but, it, but, but it's a good option for patients who've got um, bad um, systolic function. Um, so, so what's the general approach? Um, you know, if there's a patient who needs acute um, uh, ventricular rate control, how do we go about it? Uh, we've got a couple of options. Um, we've got an option of beta blockers. We've got an option of um, calcium channel blockers and um, also um, digoxin as well. Um, usually in terms of uh, um, how we go about in the hospital is because most of these patients the first ejected AF may or may not have an echo, have had an echo. Um, if they had an echo, it gives you a good idea of what their um, ejection fraction is and whether or not they possibly have any structural heart disease. So it can kind of help you, it, it kind of gives you more options. Um, but it's probably safer just to use a beta blocker if you don't have that information. Um, and then Secondly, in, um, in, in terms of um, what other options you have, um, is, is a MIA drone. Now, a MIA drone is usually used for rhythm control, but obviously um, it can be used in conjunction with a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker um, or digoxin um, to give you um, that bit more rate control if you haven't been able to achieve that with the other drugs. Um, so, so you can add a MIA drone. Um, the, the, the option here is I mean, the dosing is 200 milligrams um, or once daily, and then the, um, uh, or you can give 300 milligrams via an infusion over 30 to 60 minutes. And the, the thought is that there isn't much difference between the IV form and the oral form. Um, so what's our aim? What's our aim uh, in, in, in rate control? Well, our aim is to achieve a ventricular rate of less than 110 beats per minute. That's, um, and that's been shown to reduce um, uh, uh, morbidity. In terms of, um, you know, uh, th this, this, this number may be a lot lower in specific target population um, where, they are, where we desire more stricter control. In terms of rhythm control, rhythm control, uh, you know, the options are electrical cardioversion, so just a thing to remember is electrocardioversion has a better success rate than chemical cardioversion. Um, it's very important to think about anticoagulation in rhythm control because in acute AF, there is a theoretic risk that if you revert them into sinus rhythm, that they, their stroke could be, they, they, that we could impose a risk of stroke. Um, so it's very important to think about anticoagulation in, in when we are thinking about rhythm control and just in AF um, in general. So how do we assess the stroke risk? We use the score tool called CHAD to um, DS VASC, so CHAD's VASC. Um, and obviously the numbers uh, denote what the, um, each of the risk factors, um, how, how many numbers they're all given, how, ma how many score numbers they're all given. Um, so a score of one or more for males or a score of two or more for females, um, you need to justify, um, or you need to give um, anticoagulation, you need to consider anticoagulation, um, or obviously balancing that with the risk of bleeding. Um, let's, let's talk about elect uh, and uh, timing. So timing, so we can cardiovert immediately or delayed. Um, cardioversion. Why do we um, do it immediately? Well, if they've got a very, very convincing history of, of AF starting in the last 48 hours, then you, you want to you wanna, you wanna pounce on that window because you give your patient the highest amount of success rate to, rev to revert back to sinus rhythm in that time frame. Um, but if you, are, if you have any doubt about the onset, then it's probably safest to either um, toe cardiovert, so that means you, you request a toe for the patient and you rule out a, a left atrial thrombus um, and then you can, and if, you know, if the toe is, is, is cleared of a thrombus, then you can, then you can cardiovert. Or um, you can, you can um, uh, anticoagulate them for three weeks um, and then cardiovert them. Uh, okay. In terms of electrical cardioversion, just remember uh, electrical cardioversion is a little bit safer than chemical cardioversion. It has decreased complication rates, but obviously the, the, the downsides are you need, you know, you need procedural sedation, you need to be fasting and all that jazz. 
Um, there, is, there is some evidence that pre-treatment with oral antiarrhythmics help um, with electrical cardioversion. It improves their efficacy rates. Um, and, and these days, biphasic defibs are, are, um, are showing to be a lot better than monophasic defibrillators. And there is some arguable evidence that um, anterior posterior um, pad placement is probably superior to anterolateral pad placement. So something to consider there. And starting with 150 to 200 joules, rather than starting at a lower um, a voltage, could um, help your patients not, um, uh, could stop the patient from getting subsequent shocks. Um, so a better success rate with, with the 150 to 200 joules. In terms of chemical cardioversion, you know, chemical cardioversion can revert about 50% of patients who have recent onset AF. Um, the choices here are flaconide and amiodarone. So let's talk about flaconide first. Flaconide, it's, it's usually a first choice, but however, a very, very important point to know is that we have to exclude patients from having coronary artery disease or left or a reduced um, uh, ejection fraction. So if, you've, if you're a pretty confident patient doesn't have coronary artery disease or, do, or has normal um, systolic function, then, then it's a good choice. And you can, the dosing is 1.5 milligrams to 2 milligrams per kilogram by IV infusion over 10 minutes. The, the next, the, 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 the other choice you see probably more commonly used is amiodrone. Um, and, and, you know, it's probably a bit safer in that age group that we spoke about earlier. Oh, sorry, in that population group we spoke about earlier. Um, so the dose for amiodrone is 300 milligrams um, by IV infusion over one to two hours or 900 milligrams IV infusion over 24 hours. Um, so let's talk about long-term rhythm control for atrial fibrillation. Um, so in the long term, how do, we, how do we manage these patients? So we can use flaconide, flaconide 50 milligrams oral BD, um, or, or, and it can increase that all the way up to 150 milligrams oral BD. All right, and we've got another, another option of Sotelo. Sotelo, for, for, um, and the dosing there is 40 milligrams BD, can increase it to 160 milligrams BD. Um, however, just remember with Sotelo, can cause um, issues with, with potassium and, and QT prolongation. So it's very important for patients who you want to keep on long-term Sotelo that you regularly monitor their QT intervals and, and potassium levels. Um, and you want to avoid Sotelo in patients with severe renal failure as well. Um, the other option is amiodrone. Obviously, you as all know, amiodrone has plenty of non-cardiac side effects. So, so something to consider um, with, with amiodrone. Um, and, you know, this is outside the scope of this discussion. But, but I highly recommend you read what the extra um, cardiac side effects of amiodrone are. So the, the dosing for amiodrone for long-term um, use is usually in the, in, the, in, the, in the first instance they're given 200 milligrams TDS of amiodrone for one week and then that's a drop down to BD for another week um, before sending them, um, you know, before um, having them um, long term for just once daily 200 milligrams of, of amiodrone. In terms of when a cardiologist's opinion may be sought, well, anytime you feel like the patient is out of your depth, out of the, you know, um, you, you, they're a complex patient, they're, so they have difficult to control symptoms despite your initial treatment. Um, they have multiple comorbidities, especially they, they have structural heart disease um, and, and, you know, you, you, you're a bit concerned about what drugs to choose and, and the rationale behind them. And also, obviously, to sort an opinion for catheter ablation. Um, all right. Well, it's been uh, really, it's been really nice um, discussing this topic of atrial fibrillation. Um, stay tuned for more coming topics. Thank you.